as we get into this. Verse 5 is going right back into what we've been talking about. Therefore, being justified by faith. I want us to understand, uh, again, going back, touching just briefly upon the law that we have uh, posted here on the wall at Oakdale. The law, all it is doing is making us knowledgeable that we are sinners. That's what the law is there for. Christ came, he fulfilled the law. The entire Old Testament, you can't make, uh, rule it null and void because it proves that Christ is Christ. Every bit of it. It shows why Christ was coming. The Old Testament told that Christ was coming. All these things are there and the law that is there allows us to be knowledgeable enough to know what sin is and know God's standards and to know that we are sinners. Once we realize that we are sinners, then we can be saved by our faith. Justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ by whom we also have access by faith into His grace wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Let's look at this. There's good things in here. Number one, first and foremost, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. You know, there's no other name given whereby a man must be saved. We find that in Scripture. We find that in the Bible. We can also find that there's no other God and there's no other thing that can give us peace like Jesus. As God said, He is a God of peace. He is the author and finisher of our faith, of our salvation, all these things of our peace as well. I want us to understand that God knows what it is that we need. Amen? We can all agree on that. Where all do we look to find peace, though? Let me tell you, let me tell you. I had this conversation just a few days ago. Let me speak to you as a pastor. Let me, let me tell you some things. Uh, it's, you'll never know what it's like to be a pastor until you become a pastor. Let me just tell you. You won't. Very few people really can understand some things that I'm about to tell you. But these standards that I've told you that... Uh, people hold us to. When our qualifications are laid out in the Bible, I know what they are. I hold my I, I review those on a weekly basis. Each and every time before I can step into this pulpit, I have to make sure I can align with those qualifications. That's a pastor's duty. But then you have people that will, like I said, that will say things, I can't believe the preacher would say that. I can't believe the preacher would laugh at that. I can't believe the preacher this, and I can't believe the preacher that. All these things, they begin to weigh heavy on you. Uh, let me tell you, I don't need anybody's help to try to tear my life apart because Satan does a pretty good job at that. But let's go and let's look at this. Where is it that people attempt to find peace? Let me tell you, when you're held to these super high standards and people begin to look at you and frown upon you for like everything that is that you do, you will find somebody that will see past that. And you will befriend them for all the wrong reasons. They will become your best friend. And let me tell you why. Because they don't say those things. They don't say things like, I can't believe the preacher do this. I can't believe the preacher do that. I thought you was a preacher. They don't say those things. They just let you be. They don't hold you accountable. They don't make sure that you're measuring up. They don't care if you're living a Christian life. And you will cling to them because they don't judge you. Hey, all Christians can understand that. You don't have to be a pastor to understand. All Christians understand that. You will cling to them, and friend, that's where you will go to find peace. You're, fi you're looking for peace in the wrong direction. You're going to the wrong place because these people are not of peace. They are there, and they will cause chaos and turmoil in your life. They are the wrong kind of influences. But you'll go there. But it says, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. How is it that you have peace with God? Well, it's only through Christ. It's only through fellowship with Christ. It's only through being obedient with Christ. That is, in all these matters, you're not going to have peace with God without Jesus in any way, form, or fashion. Peace with God only comes through Jesus. We can agree on that. And if I had time, I would have marked every single place where the Bible will tell us that. Our peace with God comes through our fellowship with Christ. And friend, you can be saved and have no fellowship with Christ. 
I want you to understand. There's a lot of saved people that have no peace. By whom also we have access by faith into His grace. Where is it you find God's grace? Through your faith. You're saved by grace through faith. You do not have any of God's grace without any faith in God. Let me tell you, you don't have any of that grace without faith believing that Jesus is the Son of God and He was sent to this earth and He was condemned to die because of you and I, because we could live in perfect lives, because we were sinners, uh, because we had uh, uh, fallen so far away from God that we needed a Savior to come and redeem us so we could uh, uh, be relieved from our, our, our bondage of sin. That's why we need Jesus. You don't have access to that grace without our faith. Yet every single person, you take all these people around us and they overlook our faith. They only want to see your works. Friend, you ain't saved by works. But saved people will work. You go back to this, what people say that James and Paul were arguing about. And I've told you this many times, they're not standing face to face arguing. They're standing back to back and they're fighting different fronts. Paul is simply, and he is, it is the different uh, uh, listeners, it is the different audience that is there. He is trying to ex ex uh, uh, tell people and he's trying to talk to people that uh, uh, were of the uh, Jewish faith that they just think that they just have to keep the law and they're fine. He says, no, it's more than just the works. It is the faith that you have to have. And you go from the other side of the argument and they're saying, well, if you do absolutely nothing, you can't show me your faith. And I understand that argument too. Because you take people that will say, I'm a born again believer, I'm a child of God, I'm an heir to the kingdom, and yet they do absolutely nothing for God. I have a hard time really being able to say, yeah, they saved. Think on that. All these people that will begin to tell you, oh, I, I'm saved. Oh, I'm a child of God. Does the Bible not say that we'll know them by their works? That's what the Bible says. How will people know you if you ain't got no works? By whom also we have access by faith into His grace, wherein we stand and rejoice in the hope of the, of the glory of God. You can turn several pages on over, and I believe you'll find it, uh, I, I want to think it may be in uh, 1 Peter, what it's talking about, we ought to be able to stand and be ready to give an answer to any person that would ask the reason of the hope that lies within us. We ought to be able to do that. And what is that? Why can you be hopeful? Little Miss Avery, uh, uh, she stood back there this morning and she was able to stand there and say that she'd had a really hard week. She had a hard time. She was grieving. But yet she has a bit of, a, 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 of gladness and joy uh, that is down within her soul because she has hope knowing that she will see loved ones again. Why? Friend, that's because of the faith in which we have. That is that hope. How sad would it be to know that your loved ones, you're never going to see them. How sad would that be? Let me tell you some statements that I've heard. I've heard people say that, well, you know, my, my spouse, my mama, my daddy, my, who, my, my uh, whoever, they was lost, and I know that they was going to go to hell, so I can't get saved. At least if, if I go to hell with them, I would see them there. Friend, you ain't going to see nobody in hell. Number one, it says outer darkness. Number two, I want you to understand that you're going to be in so much pain and torment, you ain't going to know if anybody's there. What you think? You're going to hell to have a party? Friend, the only party is going to be on the other side of Jordan where we're going. Hey, that's where you're going to stand and rejoice. That's where you're going to be able to stand and praise. That's where the fun is going to happen. There is going to be no fun in the place of torments. Think on that. By whom also we have access by faith into His grace, wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Let's look at this just a little bit. When was the last time that we stood and was able to rejoice just because we hoped God was going to do something? 
hey Christians, we've got to the point that the only time we rejoice is when God does move. Hey, I'm thankful tonight that I'm standing here just knowing that God can move if He chooses to. Hey, you get back into the, into the Gospels whenever Matthew was sitting here talking that if we had faith the size of a grain of mustard seed that we could move mountains. Friend, our faith does not move the mountain. Our faith moves God and God moves the mountain. I am thankful that I serve the great I am. The I am that I am. How many other religions can say that? How many other re religions can say that they serve the creator of the universe? None, but you know what they can all do? They can all be a, a, a heap more devout than we are. Jason made mention to cults this morning. You can go back through history and you can look at different cults. You can look at different groups of people that have done some mighty stupid things for some very stupid reasons, can we not? Hey, but they still drank the Kool-Aid. Hey, there's going to be a comment that's going to come really close to earth. If we drink this Kool-Aid, I think we can jump on it and go to some other kind of dimension. How stupid does that sound? How many people drank the glass? You understand what I'm saying? You got people that are more devout to some kind of crazy thing than the fact that God created you and I and He created a way for us to stay in contact with Him. Hey friend, we've got it easy. God give us everything that we need. We ain't got to make up no some kind of uh, uh, weird thing that we got to do. All we got to do is have faith believing that God is God. How many times do we fight for our Christian rights? We don't care a bit for people to fight to take them away. Think on this. You look at other religions. Take religions that don't, they don't eat pork. Other than, I'm not talking about Jewish. I'm talking about other religions that will not eat pork. You know what they'll do? They'll, they'll stand and they will fight uh, uh, school districts. They'll fight uh, uh, different entities to say, you can't serve this because my child is of this religion and if you serve this, it violates my religion. How many times do Christians stand up and say, hey, this is wrong? That's the only time we want to try to live peaceably with all men is whenever we would have to actually stand up and fight for God. How do you understand what I'm saying? God's worth fighting for, is He not? You was worth dying for, so is He not worth fighting for? Look on these things. Wherein we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. And not only so, not only because we can hope that God will move in a mighty way in our lives. Well, how many people would love to stand and bear witness to just a, 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 a huge miracle? That'd be good, wouldn't it? How many of you talk about it? How many of you would write about it? How many of you go and tell people that, oh my gosh, I've seen this miracle. Hey, I was in this place and friend God was there. I seen him. I felt him. I, I, I could feel his touch. I could hear his voice. I could do all these things. We could, we could really get in behind that, couldn't we? As long as the right crowd was around. Now, if there's just a bunch of random people there, we, not, we might not be able to talk about it. I'm telling you the truth and you know it. But it says, and not only so, when is an appropriate time to rejoice and give God the glory? When things are going good? It's a good time, ain't it? But that's usually when we'll give all the credit to men around us. But it says, and not only so, not only in the good times, but it says we glory in tribulations also. When's the last time you looked at somebody and said, I'm glad God put me in all this trouble. That way I can show you that he's going to deliver me out of it. Thank God I'm in the valley. Hallelujah, I've hit rock bottom and I'm glad I'm here. That way you can know that my God is real. When's the last time you said that? Never. We stand at the rock bottom and we stand looking up at the hills and, and see how deep the valley we're in. And the first thing we say is, God, why am I here? What have I done? 
What did I do to deserve this? We become the rich man who's building a barn and we can say I so many times so quickly we forget to say, God, thank you for the mountaintop last week. I sure can. I, I, it makes me appreciate that a heap more when I'm way down here at the rock bottom. We glory in the tribulation. Hey, friend, God is worth glorying no matter what because you know what? He sent His Son to die for you so that way you didn't have to go to a devil's hell. I've said this so many times before. If God never done anything other than just save you, He deserves your glory on a daily basis. You should praise Him every waking moment just so you don't have to go to a place called hell. But we glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulation worketh patience. You can read that verse, and then you can read the entire book of Job. If there was ever anybody that had reason to want to throw their hands up and say, God, I quit, it was Job. How many of you in here has ever had a hard life? You ever face hard times? Bad things happen? You ever read Job? Let's compare. Let's compare what we've went through. Yes, some of you may have lost everything you ever had. But you didn't lose God. You didn't lose your eternal home. Some of you could have lost friends, loved ones. You could have lost all your kids. Did you lose your salvation? Nope. Did you lose an eternal home that God has built for you in glory? Nope. Did you lose a friend that's going to stick with you and never leave you, never forsake you? You didn't lose none of that. No matter how bad it gets, friend, you still got God. And at some point, the things that you face... I've said this before, our, our, last week we were talking about our fears and the different things. Your fears will eventually have to face your God. Knowing that tribulation worketh patience. And once we receive that patience, Paul always told me, son, never pray for patience. Because patience is only coming through those tribulations. I may not always listen to a lot of things that Paul told me, but I always did listen to that, and I've never once prayed for patience. I might should have a time or two, but I've not. But once we have that patience, you know what we have? It's that E word that's going to come behind us, a little bit of experience. You know when you go put in a job, when you go apply for something, they want somebody that has experience. They want somebody that knows a little bit about what's going on. You can take someone who, uh, who, who's who got five years experience for somebody fresh out of school and knows nothing about what's going on. You want the person with a bit of experience. Why? Because they know how to handle situations. They know how to uh, uh, handle things that are going to arise. You know why uh, he's talking about, uh, you get into Timothy and the, uh, the, the letters that was written there. Do you know why they said uh, uh, you don't always want someone that is new and fresh? Because they can be filled with pride and they can be puffed up. That's what I'm talking about. A novice, someone without experience. But at the same time, you can't ever be ashamed of your inexperience. Because, friend, you got God. And if you have your faith resting in God, then you can't be ashamed. And we're going to get to that here just in a minute. I want you to understand what all is being said here. Our troubles will bring us closer to God. The experience of, of dealing with those troubles and the experience of, uh, of just experiencing God's grace and His, His protection and His grace, these things, these bring you closer to God. If you spent your whole life on a mountaintop, friend, you wouldn't have no fellowship at all. If everything was good all the time, would you ever pray? Because let's be honest. We don't use prayer as a two-way conversation with God. We use prayer as a wish list. Then patience works experience, and experience works hope. If you've never experienced the grace of God, how do you have anything to hope in? Where, where is your hope at that point? You get back into what I was talking about, that we need to be able to stand ready at any given moment to, ask, to answer to any individual that would ask us, why is it that you are hopeful? Where is your hope lie? It lies in my experience. 
It lies there knowing that, you know what, I've been in hard times. Hey, I've been in, play, in, in, in situations where the outcome didn't look so good. But in my experience, God has never let me down. That's what I can stand and say. Let me tell you, this church as a whole, you know what you can stand and say? Hey, there's been some times that there was some pretty bad things happened to some, to some people and it didn't look too good. But you know what? The people came together and they prayed and guess what happened? God intervened. This church can say that. You know, not every church can. Now let's get tricky here for a minute. You know why sometimes we're ashamed of God? It's not really that we're ashamed of God. We're ashamed of ourselves because we have no hope in God. Now how would you feel to be a Christian and have no hope? That's a Christian that don't pray. That's a Christian that don't study. That's a Christian that don't uh, uh, attend a God-fearing church on a regular basis. That's what that is. Hope maketh not a shame. When you ain't ashamed and you have a lot of hope within you, hey, you're going to want to give that hope to somebody else. Because as they're talking to you and they begin telling you how, how, how horrible things are and how rough a time that they're having, you, you can say, you know what, you, 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 need, you need my Jesus. I mean, you may have him, but you need my Jesus. Because this is a personal relationship. I want you to understand that. Jesus may be a little bit different to me than he is to Doug. And that's probably because one of us has a heap more faith than the other one. That's what makes the difference is our faith and our hope lie that lies within but you're not ashamed whenever you know what God can do. And hope maketh not ashamed because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost which is given unto us. Without that sealed promise, the sealing of the Holy Spirit that God give you and I to allow you and I to know that we're saved. You'll know how you know that you're saved because something lies within you. You have a, a thing. You have a, 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 a something that lies within you. Not just a, 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 a figure of speech. You have a part of the Godhead. You have part of the Trinity that has came and dwelt inside of you. That, friend, is how you know that you're saved because that's what tells you, hey, friend, what you're doing is wrong. That's what gives you that little gut feeling at times. It is that that leads you and guides you into the scriptures and begins to uh, uh, teach you and, and give you more wisdom and knowledge of what God is trying to say. That is what grows your hope. Furthermore, if you ain't got the Spirit of God dwelling within you, friend, you have no hope of eternal salvation. You're not going to have one without the other. As we come off our long series about love, we have talked about how you can't love people until you learn to love God and understand the love that God has for us. You understand that by the spirit in which God's given us. As it matures, as it grows, as you feed it, because it is a thing. It is, a, it, it is an actual living thing. I want you to understand that. That is not a figure of speech that you know these writers have wrote into the Bible that people thought, ooh, that sounds good. I think I'm going to use that too. That is not what that is. But get this, for when you were without strength. You know what Paul says? Let me tell you what Paul says. Paul says that in my weakness is the strength of God perfected. You know what Jesus called us? A broken vessel. And when I read that passage of scripture, what I can think of is the episode of the Brady Bunch when they're all sitting around the table. 
and they've been playing ball in the house and they've glued this nice uh, Carol's vase, they've glued it all back together. And they got the music playing and they're showing everybody taking a little bite. And everybody's just staring at the vase, just waiting for it to leak. Friend, you're gonna leak. You're a broken vessel. We ain't perfect yet. We're gonna be, but not yet. <coughs> So I want you to understand that while everybody's sitting here and their eyes are on you, and just as your eyes are on other people, know that they are a broken vessel. They're going to mess up. They're going to fall. They're going to crack. They're going to leak. These things are going to happen. Hey, you did, and you do. There is none righteous, no, not one. There is none good, no, not one. Our righteousness is as filthy rags in the sight of God. We know these things. We have all sinned and have come short of the glory of God. Yet when other people do, we want to point it out. Look, look. Can you believe this person did that? Can you believe this person did it? They're supposed to be a preacher. I thought they're supposed to be a deacon. I thought this and I thought that. Can you believe Miss Verna's living like this? Hey, she's supposed to be a missionary. And you're supposed to support her and pray for her. Hey, you're supposed to be a Christian. You're supposed to be praying for your preachers. You're supposed to be praying for your deacons. You're supposed to be praying for your brothers and sisters in Christ. You're supposed to be lifting them up. Hey, furthermore, instead of kicking them while they're down, you're supposed to be pointing out the fact that, hey, what you're doing could be wrong. Friend, I'll be praying for you. Hey, we need to study this out. Hey, that's what you're supposed to do. Let me hurry along. I'm almost done. But it says, for when we were yet without strength. Do you know when you yield into temptation, whenever you make the, the conscious decision to sin? Because that's what happened. That's what happened. You made the decision to do it. Do you know why it is that you did it? Because you walked away from Christ's strength. You chose to sin. You chose to do it. You chose to say those words. You chose to drink that drink. You chose to, uh, to take that drug. You chose to, uh, to go out with that woman. You chose to go out with that man. You chose to enter in that website. You chose to do that. That was in a moment of weakness whenever you made a conscious decision to do so. And you consciously thought, God, I'm going to walk away from your strength. Because let me tell you, the Holy Spirit inside of you was going nuts saying, don't do this, don't do this. You know better than that. You know that sin. Hey, please stop. Stop. The Holy Spirit has told you 15 times to stop and you keep on typing. You keep on texting. You keep on walking. You keep on drinking. You keep on doing all these things and it was by your choice. And God knows that we're all broken vessels and He still chose to send His Son to die for us. He knew that the only way that we was ever going to be perfect was to send Christ and then to send Him back to bring us home and give us that glorified body. Hey, until that point, you're a broken vessel. For when you, we were with, yet without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. Oh, preacher, you can't call us ungodly. Fine. Then I want you to be godly from here on. Be ye holy, for I am holy. Is that not what God said? Was that optional? No, that's what He said. He said those words. He said, Be ye holy, for I am holy. He wants us to have the mind of His Son. He wants us to have the mind of Christ. That's what God wants. For when we were yet without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. All these people that we can't believe this about and we can't believe that about. Hey, God died for them just the same. Jesus didn't hurt any less because it was you and them. None of that matters. Christ came and died to save sinners. That's us included. <laughs> 